I am very pleased to um, introduce and welcome to the stage Professor Robert Felmuth from the School of Law and the Child Advocacy Institute, a person who is also um, working for the rights of the, of the child. I would like to welcome and thank Professor Felmuth to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. It's a privilege to be able to introduce this speaker. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Olaro Tunu is uh, from Uganda, where uh, he grew up, attended school. He uh, went to college there and then matriculated to Oxford University, where he was an overseas scholar, and then to Harvard Law School, where he was a Fulbright scholar. He's had a varied and impressive professional background, ranging from leadership in the struggle against Idi Amin in the early years of the 70s, uh, to help with the reconstruction of Uganda after the Idi Amin regime fell, to even more hazardous duty perhaps uh, with the law firm of Chad Byrne and Park in New York, uh, to serve as in the faculty of Albany Law School. But for the past 25 years, his work has been on the international front on behalf of children mostly. For 1985, he was Uganda's representative at the United Nations. He was part of the leadership for the Security Council presidency, uh, he was instrumental in helping out the Commission on Human Rights of the General Assembly during this period. Uh, he served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Uganda in 85 and 86, and then 87 and 88 served as a fellow and part of the faculty of the American University in Paris, kind of a brief hiatus from the trenches, but it was back to the trenches in 1990, where he served as president, really, of the International Peace Academy for seven, those seven years. And from 90, 1997 to 2005, he served as UN Undersecretary and Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. Uh, his work over the past 25 years speaks for itself. It will be the focus of his, of his remarks to us. I'm looking forward to hearing from him. He is now the president of the LBL Foundation for Children, an independent group. I just want to add one note. Here is a man who honors the cliché through deeds, the cliché being speak truth to power. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Robert uh, Felmuth, for your very kind and generous introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be here this evening. I'm delighted to be here to pay tribute to my very good friend, Joyce New, who I've known for many years in her work in different capacities on the vineyard promoting peace and justice. And I'm very happy to be here as well because this institute, the John Crock Institute for Peace and Justice, has been playing a very important role paving new paths in terms of scholarship as well as practical work in building awareness and peacemaking in different parts of the world, including in uh, northern Uganda. So I'm delighted to be here to pay tribute to this very important work of the Institute and of Joyce New. I also want to thank all of you very much, the citizens of San Diego, because on coming here over the weekend, I discovered that you've been very generous. You've been very generous to my compatriots, that there is, in fact, a, a community uh, of Ugandans who have settled in this area over the decades, and you made them welcome, and you've been very good to them. Among them is my childhood friend, Okara. I think you call him here Stephen Oloya. Uh, who settled here for, for decades and coming here I discovered that uh, one of our most important mamas in, uh, in Uganda is in fact visiting at this time, uh, Mama Oloya. So I want to thank all of you very much for your generosity, for your hospitality and for receiving uh, and welcoming and integrating the Ugandan community uh, here. The theme of uh, my lecture this evening is saving our children from the scourge of war. I believe that few missions could be more compelling for the international community today. 
this is a central issue of peace and justice. In the first part of my lecture, I will discuss the campaign to ensure more effective protection for children exposed to war. And in the second part, I will focus on the particular situation in the northern part of Uganda, which is uh, the most horrendous illustration of this scourge today. When adults wage war, children pay the highest price. Children are the primary victims of armed conflict. They are both its targets and increasingly its instruments. Their suffering bears many faces in the midst of armed conflict and in its aftermath. Children are killed or maimed, made orphans, abducted, deprived of education and health care, and left with deep emotional scars and trauma. They are recruited and used as child soldiers, forced thereby to give expression to the hatred and passion of adults. Uprooted from their homes, displaced children become very vulnerable. Girls face additional risks, particularly sexual violence and exploitation, increasingly being used as a deliberate stratagem of warfare. I can think, therefore, of no group of persons more completely vulnerable than children exposed to war. Yet, until very recently, their fate did not constitute a specific focus and response by the international community. Indeed, when policymakers convened to discuss issues of peace and security, the fate and well-being of children did not feature in their deliberations. Thank goodness, this has now changed. Children do not only deserve, but indeed have a right to protection and well-being. Those who brutalize children and deny them schooling and medical care in situations of war are committing two crimes simultaneously. They are destroying the present and at the same time destroying the future. That is why these violators need to be identified, named, and held accountable by the international community. And in post-conflict situations, when the guns have gone silent, it is imperative to invest in the healing, rehabilitation, and development of children. This should constitute a central concern reflected in the setting of priorities, the formulation of policies and programs, and the allocation of resources. When they are constructively engaged and are active participants, war-affected youth can be an important force for the rebuilding of their societies. But when they feel marginalized, alienated, embittered, and without hope, the same youth can easily turn into an army of spoilers and a recruiting pool for other warlords to fight new wars. Indeed, such youth, as we've seen in recent times, also become much more vulnerable to radical indoctrination and enlistment by terrorist entrepreneurs. Therefore, ensuring protection for our children and investing in their education and development is among the most important and effective means for building durable peace and justice in society. And I hope that the supporters of this institute will give even more to support the programs that are targeted for children. And I thank you for the wonderful support you've been giving for the program already. 
Over the last uh, several years, I have led a UN-based campaign to mobilize international action on behalf of these children, promoting measures for their protection in times of war and for their healing and reintegration in the aftermath of conflict. I undertook this mission by developing and implementing specific strategies, actions, and initiatives. The campaign was organized in four phases, four stages. The first phase, laying the foundation, if you like, consisted of defining and framing this new agenda, gaining acceptance and legitimacy for the agenda, and establishing a network of stakeholders within and outside the UN. In the second phase, I led initiatives and efforts working with UN entities, governments, NGOs, and regional organizations to develop concrete responses and actions and initiatives. During this period, among the initiatives and advocacy that yielded significant advances and in, 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 in innovations included significant rise in awareness, visibility, and advocacy on this issue, the protection of war affected children has now been firmly placed on the international peace and security agenda, beginning with the Security Council. A comprehensive body of protective standards and legal norms has now been put in place. A systematic practice of obtaining concrete commitments and benchmarks from all parties to conflict has been developed. Children's concerns are being included in peace negotiations and in peace accords and have become a priority in post-conflict programs for rehabilitation and rebuilding. Child protection advisors have now been integrated in peace operations and peacekeeping missions. Key regional organizations have incorporated this agenda into their own policies and programs. This issue, the protection of war-affected children, has been integrated and mainstreamed in institutions and mechanisms within and outside the United Nations, including in particular within the work of NGOs. War-affected children are coming into their own through their own active participation in rebuilding peace and in participating in what we've called Voice of Children programs, radio programs in particular, by children, for children, in the context of uh, peace building. These efforts and initiatives have created strong momentum. Yet, in spite of uh, these impressive gains, I remain deeply preoccupied by one phenomenon. On the one side, we had developed these clear and strong standards for protection and important initiatives, particularly at the international level. But on the other side, atrocities and impunity against children continued on the ground. In effect, the international community and the children were now faced with a cruel dichotomy. This dichotomy is not unique to the children and armed conflict agenda. It is a perennial problem of the United Nations and other multilateral efforts at moving from the creation, the elaboration, to the enforcement of international instruments, norms, and standards. So in my view, the key to overcoming this gulf lay in embarking on a systematic campaign of what I call the era of application for transforming international instruments and standards into an actual protection regime on the ground. The words on paper, very important alone cannot save children and women in danger. To my mind, 
the time had come for the international community to redirect its energies from the normative task of the development, the elaboration of standards to the compliance mission of ensuring the application on the ground. I've spent the last three years or so working to crack this particular and particularly important conundrum. The third phase was to institute what has now come to be known as the naming and shaming list. The purpose of the naming and shaming list was to institute a practice to identify, name, and publicly list offending parties for grave abuses against children, to underscore accountability and to exert public pressure on the offending parties. The idea was not only to publish the list, but to submit it officially to the Security Council for action. This was a controversial project in largely uncharted territory within the practice of the United Nations. It would take a lot of lobbying and negotiations before the proposed listing was adopted by the Security Council. We proceeded to develop the listing practice also in stages, building block by building block. The first list compiled in 2002 named only parties in situations of conflict which happened to be already under consideration by the Security Council and the violation for which the parties were cited was limited to the recruitment and use of child soldiers. The second list compiled in 2003 was expanded to include all offending parties, governments as well as insurgents, and in all conflict situations, whether or not their particular conflict happens to be on the agenda of the Security Council. The third and latest uh, list, published in January of last year, was the subject of protracted and difficult negotiations at all levels. But in the end, we were able to realize our most important objective, a comprehensive listing practice. The naming and shaming list now incorporates all offending parties in all situations of armed conflict or concern and with respect to all major violations against children. This became subsequently the basis for the development of a full compliance uh, regime. So the fourth and last stage in this campaign, in this work, was the task of developing that full-fledged compliance regime. Three years ago, I embarked on this with intensive process of designing, drafting, holding consultation with all stakeholders, particularly governments, UN agencies, NGOs, regional organizations. And in January of 2005, I put forward a detailed action plan, a very detailed action plan, proposing a structure and a series of measures necessary for a formal compliance regime. This was subsequently submitted to the Security Council for their approval. It took six months of intensive and uh, protracted negotiations within the Security Council and with other delegations within the United Nations before the Security Council in a major groundbreaking development unanimously adopted Resolution 1612 on July 26 last year, endorsing the structure and the series of far-reaching measures contained in the action plan. This marks a turning point of great consequence. For the first time, the UN has established a formal, structured, and detailed compliance regime of this kind. The compliance regime breaks new grounds in several respects. First, it establishes a from the ground up monitoring and reporting system, 
which is now gathering objective, specific, and timely information, if you like, the who, where, and what, on grave violations being committed against children in situations of armed conflict. UN-led task forces in conflict-affected countries will focus on six especially grave violations against children, killing or maiming, recruitment and use of children as child soldiers, rape and other grave sexual abuse against uh, children, abduction of children, attacks against schools or hospitals, and the denial of humanitarian access to children. Under this new mechanism, UN task forces are now being established in phases, ultimately covering all conflict situations of concern to monitor the conduct of all parties and to transmit regular reports to a central task force based at UN headquarters, which has been there now for the last uh, three years. These reports, I emphasize, will serve as what I call triggers for action against the offending parties. The second aspect of this uh, compliance regime is that all offending parties, governments as well as insurgents, will continue to be identified publicly and that the naming and shaming list has now been formalized. The last report I submitted to the Security Council lists 54 offending parties by name in 11 countries. These include, for example, the LTTE, the Tamil Tigers of Sri Lanka, the FARC in uh, Colombia, the Janjaweed in uh, Sudan, the Communist Party of Nepal, the LRA in Uganda, the KNLA in Myanmar, and the government forces in DRC Congo, Myanmar, and Uganda. Third, the Security Council has ordered offending parties working in collaboration with the UN country teams immediately to prepare and implement very specific action plans and deadlines for ending the violations for which they have been cited and for which they have been listed. Fourth, where parties fail to stop their violations against children, the Security Council will consider targeted measures more radical measures, including possible sanctions against those parties and their leaders, such as travel restrictions and denial of visas, imposition of uh, arms embargoes, bans on military assistance, and restriction on the flow of financial resources. And finally, in order to monitor compliance with the resolution 1612, the Security Council has established its own working group a standing committee of the Council, if you like, composed of all the 15 members, to review reports and action plans and to consider targeted measures against offending parties. And as I said earlier, where there's insufficient progress to take action. Clearly, the information compiled and transmitted in monitoring reports is only useful if it serves as trigger for action if it serves as trigger for action, not to be filed away on a shelf, on the part of key decision-making bodies, such as the Security Council, the International Criminal Court, the Council for Human Rights, regional organizations such as the EU, African Union, OAS, to take, and national governments, of course, to take necessary and concrete measures to end documented grave violations against children. The monitor reports are designed to serve this specific uh, purpose. It is also crucial that the issue of compliance be taken up beyond the corridors of the United Nations by concerned public opinion by you who are gathered here this evening. That is why it is important to mobilize an international public campaign in support of compliance. And with Resolution 1612, we have a solid base and springboard for this campaign, particularly on the part of 
young people, students, legislators, religious leaders, women's organizations, the media, and NGOs. There is a need, in a word, an important role for a civil society network of Friends of 1612. And I hope you will become part of Friends of 1612. In fact, this is a particularly propitious moment because very recent developments have underscored the preoccupation of the international community with the protection of children. The first person to be arraigned, to be charged before the International Criminal Court, one Mr. Thomas Lobanga, who is from Congo, the eastern part of the Congo, a warlord in charge of a militia group there. The main charge against him before the International Criminal Court is the recruitment, the use of children, the brutalization of children. So for this first case, the emphasis on crimes committed, crimes of war against children. More recently, as we speak, Mr. Charles Taylor, former president of Liberia, has now been apprehended, turned over to the ad hoc tribunal, the special court in Sierra Leone. And again, of the 11 charges against him, most of them are to do with violations against children, recruitment, use of children, committing rape, using children to plant the natural resources. Most of them are crimes against children. So this is a good season to be engaged with this work. And I hope those of you gathered here this evening will consider becoming Friends of, of 1612. And with the Institute here, the program which is already underway here, for which more support has been given today, you are all set to march on this path. As we meet here this evening to focus on the fate of children being destroyed in situations of war, as I indicated earlier, in the second part of my remarks, I wish now to draw your attention to the worst place on earth to be a child today. That place is the northern region of the Republic of Uganda. What is going on in northern Uganda is not a usual humanitarian crisis for which an adequate response might be the mobilization of necessary humanitarian support and relief. You will recall in this country in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina last August, Americans and the world were shocked to see some 10,000 citizens exposed to conditions of utter despair and vulnerability in the New Orleans Superdome. Now imagine in northern Uganda, the government has deliberately warehoused almost two million people in some 200 Superdomes for the last 10 years in conditions far more abominable and deadly than anything we witness on the screens in the New Orleans Superdome. The human rights and humanitarian catastrophe unfolding in northern Uganda is a comprehensive genocide being carried out by the government of Uganda. An entire society is being systematically destroyed physically, culturally, emotionally, socially, economically, in full view of the international community. In the words of a missionary priest in the region, I quote, everything actually is dying, end of quote. I know of no recent or present situation where all the elements that constitute genocide under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of, of the Crime of Genocide, the Convention of 1948, 
have been brought together in such a chillingly comprehensive manner as in northern Uganda today. Following a recent visit to the concentration camps in the north, a Ugandan journalist based in the south, Elias Bira Barema, wrote, I quote, not a single explanation on earth can justify the sickening human catastrophe going on in the north. The degradation, desolation, and the horrors killing off generation after generation, frankly, is not entirely imprecise to describe what I saw as a slow extinction facing the Acholi and Langi peoples. I encountered unique and heart-stopping suffering, shocking cruelty and death stalking a people by the minute, by the hour, by the day for the last two decades. These children, these women have committed no crime to deserve this. They deserve an explanation from their president. Museveni owes these children, these women, an answer. They deserved it yesterday, they do today, and will tomorrow." End of quote. The situation in northern Uganda is far worse than the abominations in Darfur. In terms of its duration, its magnitude and the long-term impact for the society being destroyed. Although cold facts and data are woefully inadequate to convey the full depth and measure of what is unfolding in northern Uganda, it is at least a starting point. Witness the following. For over 20, 20 years, non-stop, this conflict has been going on. For over 10 years, as I said earlier, a population of almost 2 million people, of whom 80% are children and women, have been herded like animals into concentration camps. They were uprooted, forcibly, and herded into these camps. Some 200 camps in all, in Acholi, Lango, and Teso, in abominable living conditions. Imagine 4,000 people sharing one latrine, people waiting for three days to have one jerry can of water. And if in 12 hours of waiting in line you're able to get your jerry can of water, the water point, you are lucky. And six to eight people packing themselves sardine-like in a heart of 1.5 meter radius. As a relief official said recently, in Gulu, I quote, people are living like animals. They do not have the bare minimum, end of quote. These camps have the worst infant mortality rates in the world. A recent survey by World Vision, based right here in California, reported that about a thousand children die a week in these camps. Crude mortality rates in these concentration camps are three times higher than those of Darfur. In June last year, a consortium of uh, agencies reported 1,000 excess deaths in these camps every week, meaning deaths which would not otherwise take place but for the abominable conditions imposed in these camps. And recent estimates indicate this may now be closer to 1,500 deaths a week. Last November, in the space of two days in a weary camp, 27 people were buried, 19 of them children. How many people must die in these camps? How many children and women must die every week 
before we see and recognize the hand of genocide. The NGO forum based in Gulu said quite simply, I quote, the camp population is not coping anymore, but only slowly but gradually dying, end of quote. As several reports have now underscored, healthcare is non-existent in the camps, so people are dying like flies from entirely preventable and banal causes and diseases, diarrhea, malaria, and so on. Two generations of children have been denied education as a matter of policy. Currently, it is estimated, the report only came out last week, that a quarter of a million children in the Acholi area alone receive no education at all. And this despite official government policy much heralded abroad of universal primary education. The Acholi society is renowned for its deep-rooted and rich culture, value system, and family structure. All these have been destroyed under the living conditions prevailing over the last 10 years in these camps. This loss is colossal and virtually irreparable. It signals the death of a people and their civilization. In the face of relentless cultural and personal humiliations and abuse, suicide has risen to an alarming level. Suicide is highest among mothers who feel utter despair at their inability to be mothers, to provide for their children, to give them medical care, to give them education, to save them from starvation and from death. In August 2005, last year, 13 mothers committed suicide in Pabo camp in that month alone. Rape and generalized sexual exploitation, especially by government soldiers, is now routine. Uh, noted in a report recently by Human Rights Watch, I quote, women in a number of camps told how they had been raped by soldiers from the Ugandan army. It is exceptionally difficult for women to find protection from sexual abuse by government soldiers. In northern Uganda, HIV AIDS is being used as a deliberate weapon of mass destruction. Soldiers are screened and those who have tested HIV positive are then especially de deployed to the north with the mission of wreaking maximum havoc on the girls and local women. The rate of HIV infection among the camp population, which had been at almost zero level a decade ago, has galloped to staggering levels, between 30% to 50%, compared to the national infection rate of 6.4%. And significantly, the facilities and programs of the Global Fund for Antiretroviral Drugs, although available in Uganda, Uganda is one of the beneficiaries of that program, they have not been made available and distributed to these camp populations who need it most. This is the face of genocide writ large. The deadly conditions I've just been describing, the deadly conditions imposed on the camp populations are exactly what the Genocide Convention classifies as, I quote, deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, end of quote. And in this case, cultural, economic, emotional destruction as well. Over the years, over 25,000 children unprotected by the government 
have been abducted and brutalized by the rebel group called the Lord's Resistance Army. Some 40,000 are still said to be night commuters, so-called night commuters, which means these are children who track to the towns for protection and to sleep at night and then track back in the evening because they don't have protection and they're afraid of abduction. The ugly fact is that the populations of northern Uganda have been rendered totally vulnerable. They are trapped between the brutality of the LRA and the genocide project, atrocities and humiliations which are being systematically committed by the government. The LRA have been responsible for brutal atrocities, including massacres, abduction of children who are used as soldiers and sex slaves, and gruesome maiming of civilian population. For these, they must be held fully accountable. And now five of their leaders have been indicted by the International Criminal Court. However, it is clear that the LRA factor and presence is being cynically manipulated by the government to divert attention from the genocide unfolding in the concentration camps and other atrocities being committed by the government itself. A carefully scripted narrative has been promoted, according to which the human rights catastrophe in northern Uganda begins with the LRA and will end with their demise. Sadly, key actors on the international community have bought into this narrative and have been eagerly amplifying it abroad. In this respect, the LRA and the war have become both the cover and pretext under which genocide is being conducted in the region by the government. The fact is that this war is a war of convenience, which is why you do not have much evidence of engagement between the government forces and the LRA. The nightmare and the staggering scenario I've been outlining are well known. They're well known in chanceries, UN agencies, international NGOs, human rights organizations, churches. Yet, with precious few exceptions, those in a position to raise their voices have instead chosen to join in a conspiracy of silence. This betrayal is particularly painful for the people of northern Uganda because it has come from the very governments and organizations on which they had counted to mount a vigorous defense of their human rights. The policy instead has been by the international community, we see no evil, we hear no evil. There is need for a very, very deep soul searching about the position of the Western democracies in particular to the genocide in Uganda. In September last year, world leaders meeting at the United Nations in a special summit adopted an important declaration on responsibility to protect. They made a solemn commitment to act together to protect populations exposed to genocide and other grave dangers. When their own government is unable or unwilling to provide that protection, or worse, when the state itself is the instrument of a genocidal project. This has been precisely the situation in northern Uganda for the last 20 years. But for those 20 years, political considerations have trumped responsibility to protect. 
They have trumped the protection and application of human rights. And in that calculus, the children and women of northern Uganda have become quite literally expendable. The genocide in northern Uganda presents the most burning and immediate test case for the solemn commitment made by the world leaders last September. Will the international community this time apply responsibility to protect objectively and non-politically based on the facts and gravity of the situation on the ground or will action or inaction be determined once again by politics as usual? We must denounce and stop genocide wherever it occurs, regardless of the ethnicity or political affiliation of the population being destroyed. I appeal to the Western democracies in particular to review their continued sponsorship and support for a government that is orchestrating genocide. What will it take? How many people must be dying in the camps before the Western democracies recognize the genocide in northern Uganda and move to act to end that genocide? And will you, the electors in Western democracies, support this inaction and moral complicity? As I review what is unfolding in northern Uganda, I cannot but wonder if we have learned any lessons from the earlier dark episodes of history. Millions of Jews exterminated during the Holocaust in Europe, genocide perpetrated in Rwanda, children and women systematically massacred in the Balkans. Each time we said, never again. But only after the dark deed was fully accomplished. The genocide in northern Uganda is happening on our watch on our collective watch and with our full knowledge. And tomorrow, shall we once again be heard to say, we did not know what was going on for all these years? And what shall we tell the surviving children when they ask why no one came to stop the dark deeds stalking their land and devouring its people? I make one request of those of you who are gathered here this evening because of your commitment to human rights and your commitment to the protection of children. From this podium, at this institute, devoted for the search, devoted to the search and promotion of peace and justice. From this podium, I beseech you to break the silence on the genocide in northern Uganda. I beseech you to join in the campaign to end the genocide in Uganda. I thank you for your kind attention and for your commitment. Thank you. A poster I saw in, this is what the, the writer is writing, a poster I saw in southern Uganda had pictures of Museveni and U.S. Presidents uh, George H. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush. The poster was a government propaganda poster, but it illustrates the favor the U.S. bestows on Museveni. What has the U.S. State Department done re the Acholi genocide? Isn't my government in a, a key position to address these issues? Um, the U.S. government is not only in a key position, it is in the most crucial and powerful position to make a difference on the genocide in northern Uganda because it is the most powerful, influential, single country in Kampala. 
and it's a government to which Mr. Museveni owes a lot in terms of support, uh, in terms of financial support, in terms of military support. Uh, and what is one asking to be done, just to be precise? What is one asking? Uganda is not Darfur. It is worse, more comprehensive genocide than Darfur, but in terms of solving it, it doesn't require troops, for example, to be sent. It doesn't require military observers to go there. It doesn't require NATO to be involved. It does not require the U.S. to send its men and women armed and fight their way to the camps and free the people from the camps. No. It is not a failed state. The government is fully in control of the situation. It is the government that created the camps, that moved the people into the camp, that keep them in these conditions. Mr. Museveni is in a position to say this will continue for the next 10 years and it will continue as it has done for the last 10 years. He's equally in a position to say as of next week, everybody's on notice, in two months' time you go back to your villages and it will be done. This is not some, there's not some other group that controls this outside Mr. Museveni's control. It's a very strong, powerful state, a ruthless state even, and can deliver on this. But what is needed to get Mr. Museveni to do that is pressure from the international community, in particular the US, the UK, the European Union, because they are the ones who are most close to him with a special relationship. He depends heavily on them for his survival, and uh, they are his political constituency. So that is what is needed. Concretely, what is one asking to be done? One that the Western democracies, in particular led by the U.S., recognize the genocide going on in northern Uganda. That they recognize the genocide that's unfolding in northern, not turn their eyes the other way, but recognize what is going on there. That they break the silence on the genocide. Two, that they demand unequivocally that the camps, the concentration camps, be dismantled and be dismantled right away. That is what is being asked. That's the beginning of ending the genocide because the concentration camps, they are the epicenter of this genocide. That is where people are dying like flies from the conditions imposed in the camps. So the dismantling of the camps is the beginning of the end of the genocide and incidentally, that is what the population, the camps, have been demanding. That we know we may not be safe in our villages, we may be attacked, but compared to this, compared to these conditions and this rate of death, we prefer to go to our land, till our land and eat our own food, build our own thatch house, uh, have some dignity, feed our children, and take whatever risk we take from there. So the dismantle of the camps must be now and conditional. And above all, it should not be tied to the end of the war, because that simply gives a veto to both Mr. Museveni and the LRA. Then they can say, we are working on it. We are waiting for a peace ag agreement. Give us a little more time. Give us more resources. We are working on it. Huh? The dismantling of the camps must be immediate and unconditional. And then, third, it will be important for the international community to have observers, protection, civilians, not military people, to observe what is going on in the camps, what's going on in northern Uganda, who is committing what atrocities, what are the conditions of the people in the camps. And when they're returning to their homes, to observe their return and resettlement to their homes. There are international observers in the Congo. We know what is happening in the Eastern Congo because the eyes and ears of the international community are there. There are international observers in Darfur. Why are there no international observers in Northern Uganda? Why, after 10 years of this genocide, are there no persons in the camps and the neighborhood to report to us what is going on? Why this incredible act of double standard? Let me give an example. It's a very telling example. You know, some people have been in the camps for much more than 10 years. In the Teso area, it began much, much earlier. But 
The worst phase was 1996, when people were given 48 hours to leave their homes and go in the camps. At exactly that time, contemporaneous with that, in Burundi next door, the government tried exactly the same ploy. The Buyoya government said, we want to protect the Hutu population in the rural areas from the rebels. They attack the population. They abduct children. What did the international community do? Almost in unison, the United Nations, the US, the UK, the EU said nothing doing. We won't accept that. Why? Because we know this road leads to a humanitarian catastrophe and worse could lead to genocide. You bring these communities in control situation under your control and you do with them what you want to do. So Buyoya was compelled, the president Buyoya of Burundi was compelled within months to dismantle the camps in Burundi. 1996, not a word on the camps in Uganda. The same rationale, same scheme, Buyoya couldn't get away with it, but for over 10 years people have been now dying in this camp. That shows to you the level, the depth of this conspiracy of silence, of the complicity, the moral complicity of the international community and the double standard of which I'm speaking. So there must be international observers uh, there. And you, as citizens of the US, you have a role to play. If the US government know, if the Senate knows, the House of Representatives knows that you as citizens are not willing to be part of this conspiracy of silence. You want action to end the genocide in Northern Uganda. This is a democracy. They will act. And your action will make a difference in saving the people in Northern Uganda. So you have a role to play in this. You must join in this campaign. Sign a piece of paper, put your name down with your contact or whatever. We'll organize some, some volunteers to contact you and begin right here in San Diego. You can do something concrete to make a difference.